Well, good morning. My name is Steve and welcome to Tayside Question Fellowship Online. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you here this morning, um, particularly if you are visiting us for the first time or you're a regular visitor, then we want to give you an extra special welcome to our 11 a.m. Sunday morning worship service online. Um, we continue, well, actually, this week is our final week of Faith Academy. We've, through the months of July and August, through the summer, we've been working through Hebrews chapter 11, looking at a different character each week, a different character mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 and for the way in which God has used them by faith. Um, this week, this final week, our pastor Jim Crooks um, looks at Samuel and what God did and achieved and the example that Samuel was by faith. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the series as much as I have, as we've looked at how God has done extraordinary things through ordinary people by faith. And so we give thanks for Pastor Jim and for his dedication to your word and his time that he spent preparing uh, this morning. We just pray and hope that you are um, encouraged and challenged uh, by God's word this morning. Uh, just three uh, short announcements from me um, before we get going. Um, the first one is congratulations to Rachel and, and her partner on the birth of a baby boy, their baby boy on the, in the early hours of Friday morning. Um, we just want to say congratulations to Rachel, her partner, and also to Derek and Sue, her grandparents, for the first time. So congratulations to, to you all. Uh, second thing is, don't forget the Thrive Conference. There's a little trailer after this. Um, uh, it's a Scottish-based conference about how helping you to be able to witness and serve God in your workplace. So please do follow the links um, to register for that if you have time. It's online, um, and it should be there should be some really useful sessions for each one of us if you can find a time um, to go. Uh, third thing is that we met, we met for a prayer meeting in the church uh, Wednesday just gone and we are planning a week today to meet in the building for the first time in on a Sunday in many, many months. Um, Sunday worship, 6th of September, 11 o'clock. You need to book your seat on Eventbrite. We can only have 50 people maximum um, currently call, um, to, fight, to stay within the guidelines. Um, so please do book your seat. Ross Simmons starts a new first so the first Sunday series called Resolve. So look out for the links. Um, and if you can't make it for whatever reason uh, to into the building, then our service will be streamed live on our YouTube channel and we'll be we'll be sending you the links for that during the week. But if you can make it, it will be great to see you. Those that were there Wednesday night were really encouraged. It was different to normal um, to what we're used to, but they were really encouraged to be able to meet together and we just so if you can make it, you can book a seat. It will be great to see you there next Sunday uh, for the first time on a Sunday in many, many months. Let's just pray before we um, progress our service and get into our service. Father, we just thank you for being able to meet online. We just thank you for the way in which we can, we've can we been able to maintain fellowship together um, over these many, many months in different ways. Father, and finally to get into the building last Wednesday and to meet for prayer. We just thank you for that. We give thanks for Rachel, Rachel's baby boy. And we just pray for uh, the mother and baby would settle in, would would grow in there together. They, they would, um, and as they enjoy each other and enjoy this new time together, you just pray you bless them. Bless Derek and Sue as well as grandparents. For the first time and father we just pray as we meet next week on a sunday morning uh, we just pray that that would be a really uplifting and encouraging experience we give thanks for the deacons for all the practical arrangements that have made it possible we just pray those would all fall into place and that technology would work to allow us to stream that online as well father for today we thank you for this faith academy series we thank you for the way in which you've shown us how you have achieved the extraordinary things through ordinary people. We give thanks for Pastor Jim for his dedication to your word, for the time that he spent preparing um, as we look to hear from you through 
Pastor Jim this morning. We just pray that you would we be encouraged, we be in challenged, uh, and we give thanks for this time together, Father. We commit it to you and for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, and welcome to Thrive 2020, the conference that's designed to help you live out the gospel in your workplace. What is Thrive? Six letters, six themes, T-H-R-I-V-E. It stands for teaching, harvest, refreshing, inclusion, vision, and ecosystem. How can we be pastors to other work colleagues around us, taking an interest in their lives? The world is literally needing rebuilt. Uh, and Scotland is needing rebuilt, the UK is needing rebuilt, and as Christians we uh, have the chance to be at the forefront of that as we live out kingdom values uh, in all the different workplaces God has placed us. We hit the R in Thrive, we're going to be talking about refreshing. I'm going to be sharing with you practical strategies to help you upskill in, well, being still. I'm going to be part of the inclusion stream and session. I'm really looking forward to sharing with you how you can bring your whole self, including sharing your faith in Jesus, into the workplace. We've been working around the world, helping to encourage, motivate, and inspire marketplace leaders to thrive in a complex world. I'll be talking to you about city transformation and looking forward to the Lord to bless and help us all understand this very important subject. The Lord bless you. This conference is packed with inspirational teaching, deep reflection, and honest discussion. If you're a Christian in the workplace, then this conference might be exactly what you need to help jumpstart your kingdom influence in your place of work.
at some old photos of me and uh, one thing I'll say for sure I've changed I really have and you've probably changed too and have a look at this this is a photo of me with my mum and there I am a tiny little baby then you get a bit bigger I've got another photo here this is me a bit bigger we're on holidays there and that's with my dad and I could feed myself. I was a bit bigger then. I might have sat down, read books and played. And then I got bigger again. This photo was taken when I went to school. I was big enough for school in that photo. I'm not in my uniform. I'm still in my pajamas. And there's another photo here. I've changed even more. Do you think I have? <laughs> I, I've changed. Have you changed too? I'm sure you have. Like when you get clothes out and they don't fit anymore because you've got bigger. But you know, we don't just change on the outside, we change on the inside as well because some days are good days and then some days mm, are bad days. And sometimes our friends change too, don't they? Like maybe we don't get on with friends like we used to. Hmm. And things change around us. Maybe you've moved house or even had to move to another country. What else changes? Hmm, maybe when someone you love gets sick or has to move away or you can't see them. So many changes. But there's someone who never changes. Do you know who that is? I think you might. All right, I'm going to read a verse from the Bible. It's from Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. And it says... I am the Lord and I do not change. God doesn't change. God wasn't small once and now he's big. God doesn't grow. God doesn't change his mind. God doesn't learn anything. He doesn't get old or die. He doesn't have mm, good days, mm, bad days. The Lord never changes. And because God doesn't change, all he does is good. When he makes a plan, he keeps his plan. And you know what? The Bible says something about Jesus in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. It says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today 
and forever. Jesus doesn't change. Everything else changes. We change and our friends change and the world around us changes. But Jesus never changes. And when it feels like, oh, too much has changed. Everything's different. Remember this. When you are scared, when you are sad, trust God. When you've done something that is bad, trust God. Just think a prayer and he will hear. God always cares. He's always near. His love will never disappear. Trust God. Right. I want to sing a song about how God never changes. Let me see. It's uh, from Malachi. Remember that verse? Chapter 3, verse 6. I am the Lord and I do not change. All right. Got my plick drum, got the song. All right. Here we go. I am the Lord and I do not change. I am the Lord and I do not change. Kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall, but the Lord don't change at all. No, the Lord don't change at all. God chose Israel long and long ago. And when Israel sinned, God never let them go. Listen to him. Ready? I am the Lord and I do not change. I am the Lord and I do not change. Kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall, but the Lord don't change at all. No, the Lord don't change at all. There are times we feel like we could walk on air, but when that feeling's gone, God's love will still be Listen to him. I am the Lord and I do not change. I am the Lord and I do not change. Kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall, but the Lord don't change at all. No, the Lord don't change at all. He keeps every promise and his word is true. What he is, he says and what he says he'll do ready listen to him i am the lord and i do not change i am the lord and i do not change kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall the lord don't change at all no the lord don't change at all you see kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall he wisely, wonderfully holds them all. Blessed are all who on him call. Because the Lord don't change at all. He doesn't change. All right. I think it's time for us to pray. I'll close my eyes. You can close them too to help us think about what we're, what we're saying as we talk to God. Let's pray. Almighty God, how amazing you are. Your word says you have no beginning and you have no end and you do not change. We praise you because we are weak. We see change all around us. We see ourselves change on the outside and the inside. But you are always the same. So we call on you, our rock and our deliverer. And Lord Jesus, we praise you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, no matter what. And we pray these things in our Saviour, Jesus' name. Amen. Good. Well, I think that's enough of the photos, so uh, finish up there. No, can we have no more, no more photos? Hey, I said no more photos of me when I changed, all right? No more, no more, please. Whoa, that <laughs> Can we stop? No more, no more photos. Well, good morning and welcome to 
the TCF Family Service. Uh, this is the last in our summer series looking at the uh, Faith Academy from Hebrews in chapter 11. And I've got the concluding sermon to give and it is about Samuel. And some of us will know a little of Samuel's story, but I expect uh, we need to be reminded. However, in the context of Hebrews chapter 11, his name is only mentioned extremely briefly. But the passage I want to read is Hebrews chapter 11, verses 32 through 38. The writer says, What more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release, so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. God will bless his word to us. And in that passage, in the, at the end of Hebrews chapter 11, as we've considered all of the heroes of faith, uh, that we've selected over the summer, then we're reminded that um, following God has come at a huge cost to many, and it still does. And yet we are encouraged to exercise our faith. The only way to please God is by having faith in him and having faith in his son whom he gave, the Lord Jesus. And although uh, the world might look on and, and question those who have given their lives because of their faith and their trust in God and the Lord Jesus and the gospel and the message of the Bible, God says, of whom the world was not worthy. And so they have been translated to another world. And you and I, who, if we are believers in the Lord Jesus, will be transferred to that world uh, eventually, through death or the Lord Jesus coming. However, what of Samuel? Well, I wanted to uh, select a number of things and these characteristics. He was a faithful listener to God. And the subheading for this is, you're never too young to serve God. And I expect most of us remember the story of Samuel's call to service in 1 Samuel in chapter 3. We're told there that the boy Samuel, uh, who had been born miraculously to his mother, uh, she had prayed for a child and Samuel was a gift from God for her and to her husband Elkanah. But Hannah had promised that she would dedicate Samuel to the Lord if God granted her a child. And she fulfilled her promise. And when he was weaned, when he was just a, a young boy, she took him to the temple at, or to the tabernacle at Shiloh and put him into the care of the high priest there, a high priest called Eli. And when he was serving God there, running errands and cleaning and polishing and doing odd jobs round the tabernacle, he slept in another part of the tabernacle and we're told there uh, very simply, Samuel did not yet know the Lord and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Now that's not surprising, being a young boy, but he's in the right place. And you know, it's so good to bring children to church. Um, it's so good to expose them to 
uh, the Word of God from a very early age because it's the right place to hear the voice of God. And parents, I would just encourage you again, as you bring up the children, show them what priority you have in listening to God and bring them with you. I'm glad that in TCF uh, we're not bothered at all by the noise of children, but love to hear them as they are uh, coming to the house of God. Well, one night, of course, God did call Samuel. Uh, he's one of only a few people whom God uh, called twice, and four times he used his name Samuel, Samuel. Samuel, the young boy, ran to Eli, thinking it was him who had uh, called him. And eventually Eli recognised that God was calling. And he said, after the third time of Samuel uh, appearing uh, in his bedroom, he said to him, um, God is calling you. And so the next time he calls, say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. But when Samuel went back to his own bed and slept, and God called for the fourth time, using his name twice again, Samuel, Samuel. Then the young boy Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. He didn't know the Lord yet, and he didn't use his name, but he said, Speak, for your servant hears. And the Lord revealed himself to him, and revealed things to him about the future of Eli, the high priest, and the future of Israel. And God spoke to him. And it says there, the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, the location of the tabernacle. For the Lord revealed himself to, Sh to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And God reveals himself even now, not just when we come to meet him in church assembly, but also when we are before him uh, uh, in his word, he reveals himself. But Samuel also listened to God in one of his other famous um, uh, events. In 1 Samuel 16, God calls him to go and anoint the successor to Saul, the king. And he tells him to go to the house of Jesse. And when he goes to the house of Jesse, Jesse brought all his sons to him except one. And he brought uh, the firstborn. And when they came, says for Samuel 16, verse 6, Samuel looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him, uh, a young strapping lad. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And that, of course, was a comment about the people of Israel who had selected Saul because he was head and shoulders above his fellows. He was a strapping man, and he looked as if he would be a great leader. But the Lord looks to other qualities. And eventually, uh, when they went through all the sons, Samuel said, is this all you've got? And, he's, and Jesse said, well, no, there is one other boy, but he's out looking after the sheep. And Samuel said to bring him. And when David was brought before Samuel, God said, this is the Lord's anointed. And Samuel anointed a shepherd boy, small, youngest, nothing like his brothers in that way, means tall and strapping and looking competent, but dishevelled perhaps, straight from the field. And God says, anoint him. And Samuel listened and he obeyed the instruction of the Lord. You know, it's good to have God's perspective on things. And we, we can only find that by reading his word and by getting to know the priorities of God. And it is possible, you know, to listen to the voice of God, particularly in his revealed word. And 
the graphic there says, you are what you listen to. And so many of our world isolate themselves with their music or whatever it might be. And unfortunately, some of the music, not talking so much about the quality of the music, but the lyrics are just absolutely awful. And of course, the resounding thumping in your ears are going to exclude so much other uh, noise. And the problem with our day and age, and I'm speaking to people of every age, the problem is not that God is voiceless, but that we simply do not listen to his voice. And that is because we don't know how to listen. Can I commend to you a book that I've read uh, with my brother Ben McIntyre? Uh, the book is by Dallas, Dallas Willard, and it's called Hearing God. The subtitle is about a conversational relationship with God. And you know, it is possible. And uh, I do trust that we will become faithful listeners to God. But Samuel was not just a good listener to God, but he was a proclaimer. Uh, he was a faithful prophet of God. In Acts 3, we're told, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaimed these days. And what's really interesting is that Samuel, as we'll find out, is not just the last of the judges, but he is the first of the prophetic era. Now, of course, Moses was a prophet before him, but that was centuries before. But Samuel introduces what we know in the Bible as the prophetic era. And again, going back to Samuel's call and very early in his life, no matter how young we are, God has got intentions for us. And he calls us even from when we are very young. And this was the case with Samuel. And in the record of his call, we read, all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the quality of our living, our complete dependence on the word of God, our absorption with it, our fascination with it, will certainly come out in our speech. And when God revealed himself to Samuel and told him what would happen to the house of Eli, Eli asked Samuel, what the Lord had said. And at first, Samuel was reluctant. But, you know, he spoke the truth in love. And he told him exactly what God had said. And, you know, that's the critical thing about when we're witnessing for God and when we're testifying to uh, God, that we use the words of God and the word of God. We become absorbed with the Bible so that we are able to speak the truth in love and say exactly what the scripture said. And sometimes it will be costly to speak those words. It certainly was to Samuel on that day when he told Eli what God had told him. Eli was his mentor, his spiritual overseer uh, at the tabernacle. But Samuel spoke out. And of course, it is costly sometimes to speak out for God. But if we're going to live a life of faith, then the life of faith will certainly have us speaking out for him. When we come to 1 Samuel chapter 19, uh, it says, When they saw the company of the prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as head over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul. Saul had sent messengers to Samuel uh, looking for guidance and Samuel had initially refused to come but in this, when they eventually saw the company of the prophets prophesying Samuel was their teacher he was leading them he was one who was encouraging others in knowing the Bible listening to the voice of God hearing the word of God living according to the word of God and proclaiming the word of God and maybe this is one of the great acts of faith of Samuel to teach others. And that would be a wonderful thing 
for us to do as well. Samuel was also a faithful judge of Israel. He was the last of the judges and he judged uh, all Israel on a circuit from Bethel to Gilgal and Mizpah and back home to Ramah. Never forget when I was in Israel, there are so many things to see and we were on a tour and uh, we had turned round the north of the Sea of Galilee past Nazareth and um, we were going to be heading down to the Dead Sea and we passed a road end and it had a signpost for it and it said Rama and I was just totally amazed because I knew that that was the home of Samuel and yet we weren't going to see that. I guess he's always been one of my heroes but here he is the last judge of Israel. He calls the Israelites together uh, because they're being threatened by the Philistines and they call Samuel to them uh, to exercise judgment over them and leadership for them and it says that he's old in years his sons don't walk in the way of God and the people are wanting to have leadership and Samuel goes before them and he says before them I have walked before you from my youth until this day. Here I am. Testify against me before the Lord and before his anointed. The people respond concerning Samuel. You have not defrauded us or oppressed us or taken anything from any man's hand. And you know, that's something that's a wonderful testimony to have. That not only was there a spiritual dimension to Samuel's life in terms of his being a listener to God, being a prophet of God, but he was a faithful uh, judge and he was consistent in all of his life, that his behaviour before the people was consistent with his profession. And that's something again we just need to underscore that people of faith are going to live consistently good and righteous lives. So Samuel was a faithful judge of Israel. He was also a faithful prayer, not prayer, but he was faithful in his prayers. And he was of course an answer to prayer by his mother Hannah, as we've mentioned before. She prayed for a child and God granted her the child Samuel. She named him Samuel and the name means name of God but it also sounds like heard of God and or God listens and that's something that's wonderful. My own uh, wee grandson, the middle grandchild is called Samuel. That's how they pronounce it in Pharaoh's and it's a lovely lovely name to be heard of God and to be given as a gift from God. In the Bible, Samuel has this reputation of being a prayer. And in Psalm 99, the, the psalmist writes, Samuel also was among those who called upon his name. They called to the Lord and he answered them. And he's in august company like Moses. Now I know in devotions, uh, uh, for the TCF family. We've been thinking uh, for a little while of prayers that made a difference. And although we haven't selected Samuel's prayers, there are many prayers uh, that he prayed. And we're just going to think about them, uh, think about one or two as we uh, just exemplify how faithful he was in his prayer. When Samuel goes to the people, we consider that in chapter 12, and he presents himself and he says, if anyone's got anything against me, testify against me, even now. And the people said, you've been consistent. And, and they, they acclaim him as a consistent judge who has been fair in all of his dealings. They then say to 
Samuel, Pray for your servants to the Lord your God, that we may not die. For we have added to all our sins this evil, to ask for ourselves a king. And Samuel prayed for the people. And he said, Far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, and I will instruct you in the good and the right way. And the incident that's there is that the people of God had decided, because Samuel, Samuel's getting older, because his sons weren't walking in the way of God, they wanted to be like the nations round about them and have a king. And God told them, well, go ahead and appoint a king. They've not rejected you, Samuel, but they have rejected me. And there was a sin on the part of the people to continue to operate within what we call a theocracy. We have a monarchy for uh, kings and queens, but a theocracy is where God reigns. And they rejected God's guidance and they wanted a king instead. And when they recognised that they had sinned in doing that, they asked Samuel to pray for them. And Samuel confirmed that he would and not just pray for them then, but he would continue to pray for them. Uh, he had been praying for them. That was the, the consistency of his life. And I don't know about you, but I find that aspect of Christian life the most difficult to sustain consistently is in prayer. And we've all got our own techniques for trying to help with that. But I find that the prayer diary that is produced by Alan is enormously helpful in my duty to pray for you, brothers and sisters in the TCF family. I find it useful to be uh, to have the discipline of uh, sending an email and praying for that when I'm corresponding with, with any of you as well. I, I would always, when responding to a request for prayer from friends from far-flung areas like Sam in Columbia or Janie and Evans, that I would always pray for them as I respond or as I put a comment. And uh, God has been so faithful in bearing with me in my own inconsistency in prayer. But I would love to be more like Samuel who was consistent and even prayed for the people when he had been offended and hurt by them. Uh, God tried to comfort them and said, they've not rejected you, Samuel, they've rejected me. But Samuel felt that pain of rejection as the people of God turned away from the theocracy and maybe turned away from Samuel's own sphere of influence. But he he was able to swallow any pride that he had, whether there was any element of that, and he continued to pray for the people. And he was a faithful mediator because of that. So in First Samuel in chapter 7, where the people of God are oppressed by the Philistines, and they just don't know how they're going to uh, respond to this constant pressure and constant warfare. And Samuel appears before them and comes to judge them. And prophetically he says, well, the problem is your idolatry and that you're not following the Lord wholehearted. And then he says, if you're returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth from among you. Direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only and he will deliver you. You see, that's the call that preachers will have ever since Samuel and even before, to serve the Lord with all your heart. And that's something we need to be reminded of, because we do get diverted from the worship and service of God by all kinds of things, sometimes even by legitimate things like family or career or or our responsibilities to others and generating income. All of these are, are legitimate in their own way. But if they take the place of God 
and we put them before God, before the worship and service of God, then we've got to deal with it. And Samuel, he had recognised that the people of God were slipping away and so he challenged them. And it's right that we should be challenged. And then Samuel said, gather all Israel at Mizpah and I will pray to the Lord for you. Here is a man who in his prayers and because of his example could turn a whole nation. Oh, how we need a Samuel today, don't we? We need a Samuel that can gather all the believers together so that we could pray in repentance and know the Lord's presence in us. Samuel gathered all Israel and he prayed to the Lord. And after the people of God had gathered together and confessed before the Lord and had committed themselves to God, Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen and called its name Ebenezer. No, Ebenezer, Scrooge. Uh, we used to have a hall in Inverness um, and it was called Ebenezer Hall. I was a member of the church there. We changed the name after we got an electricity bill addressed to Mr. E. Hall and it's now Selt Street Evangelical Church. But the term, the name Ebenezer, simply means to this point the Lord has helped us. And Samuel recognised that God had worked a great miracle of grace and he wanted to mark that for history and put up that stone and given it the name as a reminder. And of course we still do that today. We put up statues and we put up stones. Some of them are being hauled down because of their association with the slave trade or whatever it might be. And testimony in stone is not as valuable as we think it might be. Uh, but here in this stone, we've got a testimony to the Lord. And as Samuel prayed on behalf of Israel, as he lived a life for and on behalf of all the people, as he prayed unceasingly for them, the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. What a wonderful um, story is his. But in this last slide, I want to I want to apply something of the, the message, the story, the biography of Samuel and apply it into our lives. He's so like the Lord Jesus in many aspects. He was a miracle child. God gave a wonderful gift in the boy Samuel, but he gave an even greater gift in the miracle child that is our Lord Jesus. We should be preoccupied with the Lord Jesus. We find, of course, that Samuel was busy when he was young in the temple. The Lord Jesus was busy when he was young, also in the temple. Remember the story of the Lord Jesus when he says to his uh, mother and father who were looking for him after missing him for the return journey on their way back to Nazareth, they had visited Jerusalem and the boy Jesus was lost and they went to retrieve him and they found him in the temple and he said, I must be about my father's business. That's his heavenly father. And the Lord Jesus, even from when he was young, knew and understood he was called of God and he uh, came to understand that he was the very Messiah of God. Samuel, we've said, was a faithful listener. The Lord Jesus, of course, listened to his father. He says, I did not speak on my own, but the father who sent me, command me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. God gave him the very words and the Lord Jesus was a good listener. Something I need to consider as well about being a good listener first of all, to the very voice of God, to read his word, 
to be devoted to his word, to cultivate a conversational relationship with God, it is possible. Samuel was also a faithful prophet. So too was our Lord Jesus. I have given them the words that you gave me, says the Lord Jesus. And as we look at the record of the word of God, we're reminded that this is the very wisdom of God given to us. As we listen to the voice of the Lord Jesus in the Gospels, or as we listen to the Apostle Paul and the instruction given to the churches and in all of the other epistles, as we listen to the narrative of the Old Testament and faithful saints who had a relationship with God, we discover the very words of God. And of course, if we are to live for him, and if we are to proclaim him, if we are to preach him, then we've got to know what he is saying and spending time alone with God in the conversational relationship in his word is an essential part of Christian living. An equally essential part is, of course, being a faithful prayer. As Samuel prayed consistently for the people of God, as he was unceasing in his prayers, the Lord Jesus too is a great prayer. And we read uh, in Luke and in John and in other places, he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. And if the Lord Jesus needed to pray, how much more do we? So find your desolate place. Find your private place and cultivate that relationship with our Lord Jesus to spend time alone. I'm so very fortunate to have a study where I can go to be. And I'm in the study at present, and you can see I'm surrounded by memories and books. And this is where I love to be with God. And there have been some special moments in this very sanctuary where, I'm, where in prayer God has revealed himself. You may have seen, even as we've been uh, going through this message, one or two messages have appeared from others and I know that these are very special people in my life. Matty Blakeman, Alistair Purse. And they're commenting, I know, about things that have been said about the book of Revelation. Or about books that we've read. And this is such a wonderful thing to do. And to spend time alone with God in prayer is such a wonderful gift. Cultivate it. We also need to be a good mediator in our prayers as Samuel was a great mediator leading a whole nation to repentance to God but he is unlike the Lord Jesus who is the supreme mediator he is the one who has been appointed by God there is one mediator between God and man the man Christ Jesus and it says he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. You know, it would be a wonderful thing to be so uh, absorbed in prayer on behalf of others that we have routine answers to prayer in the salvation of others, the salvation of our family, in the salvation of our friends and neighbours, our colleagues. He is a faithful mediator and he calls us to be the same too. The last point I wanted to make is just simply this. And it's a very telling part. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have rejected you, they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. And in the story of Samuel, we've got the seeds of rebellion on the people of Israel, who when they were presented with the very Christ of God, the hope of the ages standing before them, their very king, they said, 
away with him, away with him. And in the story of Samuel, we've got the seeds of that rejection. Oh, how sad it would be if, on thinking of the example of Samuel, thinking of the faith of others down through this series in the summer, that we didn't have that same kind of faith in God, in the Lord Jesus, in his finished work in Calvary. The saddest thing would be at the end of this summer. There is a verse in the Bible that says that the, the, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and you are not saved. How awful it would be if we got to the end of this series and considered the life of these godly examples of great faith if we didn't exercise even a little faith and we rejected, if we rejected the one in whom the, it, it's the one who is only worthy of our faith and our commitment, the one who proved himself to us in the giving of his son. Well, I just leave the example of Samuel uh, with you and the example of other of these other giants of faith and trust that you will know a saving faith. It's not just a belief in anything. It is a belief, a commitment, a trust in someone and in coming to possess that great gift of God, the very gift of faith then we will have a gift that keeps on giving into eternity. May you come to know him and live the life of faith that God calls us to, for without faith it is impossible to please him. May God bless his word. Shall we pray? Father, we do just leave uh, the examples of these great giants of the faith down through the biblical history. We leave them with you and we leave the word that has been preached over these many weeks just to soak into our hearts and souls. And even this example of Samuel, oh Father, we do pray that if you are calling individuals even now, that they would respond just like the boy Samuel, so irrespective of age, young or old, that each of us might say, speak, your servant is listening. Father, may we come into the life of faith or continue in the journey of faith and may we be faithful in our generation as Samuel was in his. We commend your word uh, to you and pray, Father, that you would just speak to us by your spirit. We commit ourselves to you. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you very much for joining with this series and may you come to know the God of faith or if you're walking in it already in this journey of faith that you will continue and you will be faithful. God bless.
Good morning, and as we come to this point in our service, uh, we're going to take bread and wine in obedience to the instruction of the Lord Jesus to remember him. The invitation from the Lord Jesus is open to everyone who is a believer in the Lord Jesus and who can profess a personal experience of salvation by trusting in him. So regardless of age, gender, status, or any other human quality, Jesus invites us to remember him. Laura is going to read one of the definitive uh, passages from the Bible on celebrating the Lord's Supper or communion. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 3 to 26 For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Thanks, Laura. The passage that we know so very well tells us that this act that we now undertake is a remembering of Christ. Do this in remembrance of me. And he's our focus. And as we come together to take bread and wine, we are focused on him and not ourselves. It's also a savouring of the new covenant uh, in his blood, because he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. And as a covenant, we're reminded that God promises things to us and we come into the benefit and the good of that. And he upholds those promises uh, by his own authority and by his own grace and his love to us. But it also tells us that this is a proclamation of the gospel because he said as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The death of Christ means so much to us because without Calvary we wouldn't have the forgiveness of sins. We wouldn't have the assurance of a home in heaven but because the Lord Jesus died for us we have all of these things and we're also told of course, as part of the gospel, he's coming back and he may be coming back soon. But we should also remember that this act is an expression of love for each other. There's a very significant word at the beginning of the passage and that is the word for. So that links it to the passage that's just gone before it. And in that part of 1 Corinthians 11, Paul was saying that the behaviour by the church at this meal had the effect of making some people feel ashamed of being poor. And that was because the Lord's Supper was celebrated at the end of a meal in the church in the early days. And some had brought a huge picnic and other people, those who were very poor, had nothing. And the Lord's Supper is not supposed to make anyone feel any different, to be ashamed. Uh, and poverty in itself, in any case, is nothing to be ashamed of. And what was a shame was that some people in the church were making uh, others feel differently. So when we come to the Lord's Supper, it's a great leveller. Even in our own homes, the Supper reminds us that our Lord Jesus loved every one of us just the same. He loved us so much that he died for us. He loves us so much that he lives for us equally. Not one of us is loved more or less than the other. And it was still necessary that he died for the rich as well as for the poor. So as we celebrate together, let's remember his love for us. And let's remember that when he calls us uh, together, even as we are gathered virtually, 
that we're here only to remember him and that everyone has the same access and we're treated all the same and it's good to remember each other in love that uh, everyone is regarded by God right now with total equality. So let's pray for the bread, the symbol of his body. Father, we thank you for the bread that we're about to take. We thank you that it reminds us of the body of the Lord Jesus, the body in which he was uh, so um, victimised and brutalised and he suffered so dreadfully on the cross of Calvary. And yet we remember that uh, his body is also used as a metaphor for the whole body of Christ. And as we come together just now, each in our separate locations, we're reminded that we are part of his body, the church. And we thank you that he gave himself for it. And so we remember in this broken bread that he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. We thank you for this bread and we thank you uh, that it speaks of his body given for us and as we remember him, we worship him. Amen. Mm -hmm. This is my body, which is broken for you. And at that last supper um, with his disciples, the Lord Jesus then took a cup and he gave it to them and said, this is the new covenant, the new testament in my blood. Let's give thanks for the cup. Our Father, we thank you that not only did the Lord Jesus bear our sins in his own body on the tree, but that he paid the price of our sins in full by the shedding of his blood. And he gave us a cup to remember him by. And as we take this cup now, we remember the price of our sin and our salvation was his shed blood. We thank you from our hearts for the dying love of our Lord Jesus. We offer our thanks for him, for his blood shed for us, and for this cup now, and we offer our thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to have one uh, final reading as we come to our, uh, the end of our celebration of the death of the Lord Jesus. Laura. Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 to 11. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, completes my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ, who 
though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Thank you, Laura. So as we come to the end of our time of communion, we just commit uh, each other to the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, to the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and to the love of God who is with us. And these all three persons of the Godhead are with us at all times. Amen. Thank you for joining us. To find out more about Tayside Christian Fellowship, visit tcfperth.org.uk. Together, we worship Jesus and communicate his love in all we do and say.